All right, so today I'm going to talk to you about some research we're doing in our lab. But before I get there, um, I want to put a couple of things in context. So we were at the table, and um, the question was asked to me a little bit about what we do. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we do in our lab that's a little different than what you suspect. So most people see, they'll look at me and say, he's a professor at Clemson in the School of Computing. And so they say he teaches, and they probably write grants to federal agencies, do some research like that. But we are highly engaging with industry. So we have very good relationships with industry where we can provide research opportunities for industrial partners. And BMW is one of our partners, for example. Um, and so what we do, we'll develop solutions in the forms of what we call proofs of concepts that then can later be taken through a process to become products. And we work with industry on that. And the benefit of that is that, uh, for example, industries, and maybe you are one of these industries, that may not have a research arm. And if you do, it, some things may be too risky for you to go into. Well, that's what we do. We do. We're in the business of high risk kind of things. So we can do that, and it does, it's a lower cost, not only financially, but a lower risk for us to do it rather than most companies. And so I just start with that. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about this holistic usability measure. So it begins with usability, and this is my quote. If you could build a system that resulted in world peace, but no one could use it, it would be useless. So usability matters. And this is often what we've seen as an afterthought, meaning uh, people will say, well, okay, we, we have a plan to develop something, and we're going to study it and do usability and determine how effective it is. And as you go through the development process, what happens to your funds? You say, well, we're over, and we've got to cut something. So what gets cut? <coughs> the usability. <coughs> Now, this is an interesting finding. You know, there's been no generally agreed upon method of measuring usability. So if we look at the scientific method, we look at engineering, there are agreed upon standards for certain things. But usability, we don't have that so much. So this is another problem with usability. We know it matters, but how do I make the case that I need to do it to upper administration or my client? In other words, what's the return on that investment, one? And, and two, how do I know that it is at the level of usability that is satisfying for us, meaning the client or their customers? So what is holistic usability? If you look at technical definitions, you will see this pop up all the time, meaning effectiveness, efficiency, and user satisfaction. Well, the problem is, how do you measure those in such a way that it can be easily translated and you understand the extent by which something is actually usable? Those are definitions that help. And then also, what really counts? And I've come back to this theme again a couple of times in this talk. But for example, uh, is effectiveness more important than efficiency? Or is user satisfaction more important? And there are certain scenarios where that may vary. Uh, we, we did one case where we developed software for um, law enforcement officers. They could care less about satisfaction, but what mattered to them was efficiency. They wanted to be able to get information in less than a minute to an officer in the field who may be in a dangerous situation. So they didn't care if, if they really liked that interface. It was more important for them to be able to get the critical information in a timely manner. So that's another thing. And I'll, again, I'll come back to that in a second. So holistic usability is a single measure that would tell you to the extent something is actually usable. That's the goal. That's what we would love to be able to do. So you ask them, you say, is that usable? And they could say, yes, that is 90% usable, rather than uh, on effectiveness, it rated pretty high, and uh, efficiency, we were okay. User satisfaction, they didn't like it. That doesn't tell a, a coherent story necessarily. Uh, what's out there today is something called SUS, System Usability Scale. Has, have any of you ever heard of this thing before? A few people. Okay, so this is a, a common scale that is used 
uh, in the field to do usability, but in actuality, and you can kind of see some of the questions here, uh, in actuality, it's more measuring user satisfaction than the other factors. So actually, it's, it should say system user satisfaction usability scale or something like that. But this actually gives you a single score. So I was putting it up as an example to show that. And this, this is how you, you measure it. I won't go through that technical stuff, but uh, they do have a method for measuring. All right, so this, this is just some details about how they score it. And it's not a complex process, but it is a scoring based on every other question, even or odd, and giving them certain points. And as it results in a final score, uh, and then when you get that score, it gives you the overall usability. But again, even if you look at the questions, and I think I'll show it again, if you look at the questions here, they all start with I. So it, it, those questions tend to say this is about you, your perspectives, and your satisfaction with the system. So this is a good measure for uh, user satisfaction, but it doesn't give you holistic usability. And this is their scale. So we like scales, right? We know we're, we start early in school and we understand this 90 to 100 and all the way down. We like scales, those letter grades. That's simplistic. And that gives us some determination of the goodness of something or, or the, uh, the quality of something if we have a scale. And this scale is just common and people understand this. So when they see a SUS score and it's uh, a 92, they like that. But people misinterpret that, again, as being the usability of the, the whole system when it's just user satisfaction. OK, the benefit of this is a short questionnaire. If I'm comparing satisfaction of more than one type of system or interface, this will give me a score that I can compare the two. And the one with the higher score is presumably better. Uh, easy to calculate. And doesn't, but it doesn't work across all systems, per se. Again, it only captures user satisfaction. So what we need is a true holistic usability measure. And that's what we've been working on in our lab. And what we mean by that is, is something that would give us the ability uh, to rate the system on that scale, on a similar scale, but in a holistic sense, meaning including things that are of interest to you. And I'll show you what that means in a second. We often, when we work with clients, we'll find that the clients will say, well, who gets to decide the primary goal of the system? Is it the designer, client, or manager? So in other words, there's different players. And some of you who are familiar with this, you have a role that you play in deciding the, the future of this technology or interface. As such, you weigh in on what's the importance of certain aspects of that or what needs to be done. So the question comes, who, who decides did you build the system right? Is it the right interface? And again, going back to the usability of it, does it work? So the things that we are good at measuring, for example, we can give it metrics that say, uh, we need to be able to get information from the database. Um, <laughs> with these types of queries in a certain amount of time. We can measure that and determine those mm -hmm. kind of things. But the question is, is it actually usable? And how do you know if your system is better than another one? And this is kind of the, the way we operate in our lab, is we build alternatives. So if you were to say, OK, here's, here's what I need. This is my goal. And we'll go off and build two or three proofs of concepts. And you say, well, they all look good, but well, is one better than another? And if it is better than another, how do you know that? Along what metrics? And again, we must test it in order to figure it out. So we have people test it, and we learn about their feelings on the system. But again, there's other measures, uh, efficiency, effectiveness, and other things that, that matter too, other than just their opinion. So we begin this process at the requirement analysis phase or information design. 
uh, we talk to the client and find out what it is we're supposed to build. What's your goal? What are we targeting? And what we, what we find is in these conversations of requirement analysis is that uh, people miss the usability metrics. Again, it's usually an afterthought and it gets cut because we're, for production of building the software, they end up running over budget. And they say, well, we're over budget already and they cut usability. Quantitative metrics. So when they do say we're gonna do usability, we want quantitative metrics. And these are things like accuracy measures, task completion time. These are things that are easy to measure and they give you a quantitative me measure. Mm -hmm. And people like those. Subjective metrics though, these are the ones that are a little more tricky when you get users' opinions about them and we can use scales uh, like a Likert scale to determine uh, to what extent they like something and, and finding out the ease of use. So you have like these two general categories that you will find data falls into from these usability studies. But this is the key point. Which metrics are most important? And so what we find is that uh, depending on which client you talk to in a sp particular industry, they may have similar metrics. Again, they could be user satisfaction, uh, effectiveness, efficiency, but they may have different weights or a different importance depending on your domain. So the idea is if, if you have one industry who says uh, our users have to use our system, so satisfaction is not that big a deal or another industry who says our users are paramount. We have a lot of competition, so we have to make our users happy. So right now, we really don't have a way to distinguish that in practice today, to accommodate both of them, such that you get a single measure that matters to the client. And this is, again, the point here is all interfaces are not created equal. Meaning, even within a certain enterprise or certain company, you have systems that do different jobs. And so even in evaluating those, your metrics may vary, and may, some metrics may be more important than the others. And again, that, that just doesn't exist right now. We don't have uh, tools that allow us to measure this overall effectiveness. So this is where we come in. The holistic usability measure is uh, something we design with this, this problem in mind. And so what we do, we assign a, a metric or a weight uh, based on the importance uh, for, for everything you want to measure between one and 99%. And I'm going to give you an example in a second. You design and implement a system. So what we do, we sit down with a client and the client will say, here's the thing we want to build. And we'll ask them, so what are the uh, important aspects we want to measure about usability? Let's say things like task completion time, accuracy, uh, user satisfaction, um, and, and a bunch of other different things they may want to measure. And then we'll say, okay, so if I give you 100 points and you gave me five metrics, you could take the 100 points and assign them to the five metrics with respect to how important one is to another. So one metric, rather than making them all equally weighted, one metric may be worth uh, 40% or 40 points, for example. So we design, implement it, and then we evaluate it with those metrics in mind and their corresponding weights uh, of importance. And this is what it looks like. I am a professor, so I have to put a little equations up here. <laughs> so uh, essentially, uh, those 100 points, you have a weight and you have a metric. It could be user satisfaction, task completion time, whatever it is you pick. And then uh, you say, well, this one may be worth 20%, this one's worth uh, 40%, and so on, until you have 100%. And uh, in this scenario, we can use this and calculate a holistic usability measure with those weights. So this should look similar or familiar to you all it, it, it does probably because this is similar to how we graded you in school. 
It's like you have assignments in class or projects and each one have a different weight, but the total weight is 100%. So most people are familiar with this kind of thing and it looks kind of with these W's and everything, it's a little cryptic, but this is what we actually do to, to calculate grades in, in classes. So here's the example. So we have user satisfaction, <laughs> task completion time, and accuracy. So a client may say, it's, it's important for our, us to have user satisfaction. They say, we, we rate that as 70% of our importance. <laughs> Task completion time, 20%, and accuracy at 10%. And these could change. Okay, so uh, with this model, we found that clients, independent of their background, whether it's technically inclined or not, they understand the model, and then the results to come out is a number between 0 and 100, and you say, well, this thing is 80% usable based on the specification that you gave us uh, relative to these metrics. So you, for your specific industry, for your specific application, in your specific domain, you decide your weight, and then we do the studies and we collect the data, and we can tell you how usable it is based on your own preferences. Now this has a lot of advantages. Not only is it simple and easy to use and gives you a, a single number, but we can use this to compare systems uh, from different industries even, we, and within the same industry. Um, it gives us a lot of power that we hadn't had and still don't have pretty much. It makes usability more engineering-like in the sense that we do actually have a metric or somewhat of a standard that can be established. The other benefit of, of this is from an accountability perspective. So you could, in theory, uh, say, have a manager who says, uh, I want someone to come in and we need to have our systems usable at a minimum of 85%. And these are the constraints which we operate under. Can you deliver an 85% usable system? You see, it becomes an accountability uh, factor as well. That would be kind of difficult to do, but you could do that. Now we've used HUM uh, in studies in my lab and results have been outstanding. We've used it on different types of systems, uh, systems that were telephony and speech based, systems that had a GUI and that were multimodal, meaning you could touch them and talk to them, all types of systems. And what we found is that the results are meaningful. In other words, uh, when we get a usability measure, it means something to us now. Uh, I know that if it's 80%, that's good, or if it's 60%, that's bad. We have a meaningful measure. And again, you get goals, and you can demonstrate success. Uh, as a usability expert, so let, let's say um, you guys like this and other people like it, and this becomes a standard. So in the foreseeable future, what you would have would be individuals <laughs> who say, I'm a usability expert, and the projects I worked on, the average holistic usability measure is 95%. So now, if you're going to hire somebody to do usability for you, and you see someone's resume come across and it says, we have an average of 95% uh, usability measure, we can get you at 95%. You say, okay, I want this person. I want this team. They're pretty good. So it gives you a measure to actually judge people by as well. So here's where we're headed with this project. Um, there's some tricky things about this that when you get, at, get, in down, get down to, into the weeds as far as the details. What we want to do is build a, a website that allow people to come in and use it to calculate the holistic usability measure. So let me go back to here. So again, uh, user satisfaction uh, is usually captured by either like an SUS or some kind of survey, right? So when you capture that, you have a scale for user. Uh, so it could be on a scale one to five where five is high. So you end up with a 4.5, right? So that's a high number, and you need a way to translate that so that it works in this formula. Uh, I'll give you, a, here's the, the one that's tricky. Task completion time. A good task completion time is lower. So the lower the number, the better, rather than higher. If it takes uh, you know, 28, 28 hours to do something, that's bad. 
whereas it takes me a minute to do it. So the lower the time. So you have to scale these items and make sense of them for this equation to work. And accuracy could be measured in, in a different way as well. So what we're looking at is de designing a tool uh, whereby it would be hosted online. So you have a usability expert uh, who would come in and say, well, we're going to um, do your usability for your company, and we're going to use uh, the holistic usability measure. We're going to use HUM. And so you, they can agree upon the metrics and everything and enter them into this website go off and do the experiments and actually put the data into the website and the website does all the calculations based on these factors and gives them the holistic usability measure. That's where we're headed. Okay, so, um, so Dan, did that make sense? <laughs> so anyway, so that's where we're headed uh, is, is for this to be a service somewhat in the cloud even potentially where we can even, even extract data automatically from usability studies. Um, if, you, if you're thinking long, long term, that's where we like to be. This could be an application in the cloud where people, if you were building apps on your iPhone or some other device, and as they're using it, you could collect data and dump it into this application, and your usability measure could be calculated on the fly. So then uh, management could come in in the morning and say, every morning, as part of my annual report, I want to see our holistic usability on our applications. How is it being used in real time with real people? So that's where we want to go uh, with, with this kind of application. <coughs> Conclusion, uh, again, it's a tool for testing. It reports usability. Uh, we've tested it. We haven't completed our website yet, but that's where we're headed. Uh, there's multiple ways to design the same system, but which one is best? this tool would allow you to decide which one is actually the best, rather than flipping a coin. Uh, it's easy to use and it makes sense. It's easy for anyone to understand that measure once you get it. That's the other benefit. And recall, there's been no generally agreed upon method of measuring usability. Well, this is one way we could resolve that issue is through a holistic usability measure such as what we're uh, proposing. All right, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you. Um, you said you work a lot with BMW, is that right? Mm -hmm. What are some ways that you're using your uh, approach to measure their usability? Uh, he asked me, um, we work with uh, BMW, and what are ways they're using this approach? Uh, and at BMW. They're not using this. They don't know about this yet, unless someone in BMW is here. <laughs> they haven't seen this part. There's other things we do with BMW. Um, I could tell you, yeah, I could tell you some of it, but not all of it. So one, <laughs> one particular project we have with BMW, um, if you buy a BMW, like most vehicles today, uh, they're very complex now. And if you look at the manual for your BMW versus your 1976 Pontiac Firebird. It's a big difference, right? So what we found is that uh, the manuals have become larger and more complex. So we have a method by which we can take any manual, it doesn't matter if it's for a vehicle or whatever, and we turn it into what we call a conversational manual. So in other words, and we have a video for this, and uh, well, where's Phil at? Uh, I, can, I can send the link to you and you can share it with everyone, but we have a video, a YouTube video of this, whereby you could actually talk to the manual. So the BMW, you push a button in the car, and you say, how do I use my windshield wiper or whatever? Where's my this thing or that? It's conversational. So they have an interest in that. Yes? How do you deal with objective questions? Because a lot of this is asking the user questions, and I can get 95% just by asking questions different ways. Yes, that is a good point. Uh, hopefully you have an expert who uh, is better than that. <laughs> so the goal is, that's part of the trick. If someone's a usability expert, they know how to ask the question. So everyone understands that the way I ask a question can determine your answer in, 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 to a certain extent. Not everybody can do that either, right? But you need someone who understands how to ask an appropriate question. 
And again, that's why I show like the SUS, they have a standard set of questions. So if you were using something like that, it, it eliminates some of that bias if it's a standard set of questions. But often the case, what we find is that when we do work with industry partners, they'll have something they really want to know and it's not on that survey. And so we have to put it in there. And so then it takes some wordsmithing with respect to how to ask that question such that you don't bias them. And that's not easy to do because you know your client is saying, no, we got to ask it this way. This is great. This is how you ask that question. And you say, well, no, that's kind of leading them. And you say, well, no, and you go back and forth. So hopefully you can resolve that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Is this just application specific or is this for networks? This is independent of any application. Uh, you could use this anywhere on anything. And again, it doesn't even have to be. I, I could use this even on uh, a physical device that doesn't have any computing. So the idea is, is it doesn't matter what the artifact or product is. The point is that we want to know if something is usable. So you, you invest in creating something, and now you want to put it on the market. And you want to know, is it going to be successful? Will people like this? Is it usable? Can they use this in a way that works for them? And this is what this is about. In other words, you test it, and you'll get some feedback and understand, can people use it the way you see you think they should? Okay, and, and so that's part of this. I didn't talk much about that other aspect, which is, uh, you know, this is your, your client and designer's intent. So you have an intention on how a product is supposed to be used. And so with this method, you can actually see if it's being used by that intent with a measure. Yeah. Uh, was there a question over there? Yes, sir. That is great. <laughs> that is a great question. Uh, I hope to have it available uh, sometime this year in, in 11. Uh, is it free? We're thinking of making parts of it free to a certain extent. Uh, so this is how it works in the university system. So as a university, I can't charge and be for profit. So if someone was to come along, my friend Dan here, if Dan says, okay, I like this and we do hosting, and you know what? I want a piece of this action. So Dan and I sit there and I say, Dan, I need you to talk to CURF. CURF stands for the Clemson University Research Foundation. What they do, they take external entities and they say, we have a technology at Clemson and uh, we're going to license it exclusively to you. So Dan can get exclusive rights to this and then Dan's responsible for going out and marketing it. And then he'll pay a license or royalty fee back to the university. And that's how it works. Uh, probably the most notable example of this in history is Gatorade. Gatorade was created at the University of Florida. That's a multi-billion dollar industry. And it came out of their labs and was licensed. And that's how it became uh, so famous. So universities, again, that's what, my point I was telling Dan is universities look at that Gatorade model in a time where funding from the state is low, tuition doesn't cover everything, and a grant from the federal government is three to five years, where Gatorade, like a 20-year you know, revenue stream of a billion a year or something like that, is just off the charts. So universities are extremely encouraging faculty members to partner with industry to do these kind of endeavors. So I don't know how much. It just depends on if someone wants to come and license it, but we plan to offer at least uh, part of it is free. We'll probably offer it free to academic institutions for training. You know, the, the Microsoft model, uh, meaning you give it away to universities and classrooms so the people use it when they graduate and get their own businesses. That's all they know, so they end up using your product.
Yes, and, and the way that works, so this is how I would address that. Remember I had a slide on this where you, you meet with the client first and there's an agreement upon what the study's going to be. So in that case, the client, so if I'm coming in and I'm meeting with a client, I don't know their industry and they would have to tell me we have these classes of users and these are the cases I want you to examine. So then I, they may say, just like you did, well, in this case, satisfaction or this is more important. I want to change the weight for these types of users. So then what that does is help inform me, the usability expert, to come in and say, okay, so we're going to have uh, three or four cases that we would examine. And a case is defined by the user population. And in each one, I give you a hum. And so you'll be able to see how the hum, again, that's the flexibility of this, is that you can do that now. You can actually say, uh, the people who are going to use it uh, just for ple pleasure or just for fun versus the people using it for work or different applications and things like that, you, you may weight it differently. And you will see the outcomes relative to that. So that's what we would do. And then there's micro follow up. No, that's actually more common. It's, it's not just you. That's very common. In other words, the, the individual that hires you, and I put up definitions of, of types of people. So you have a client, you have customers, uh, different stakeholders. And so at some point, you report to someone. And that individual or that group, that's who actually determines the measures, the weights, in other words. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, it's often the case that, in, like in your case, you, the superintendent or someone hires you and they tell you they was, in our case, established weights. But then teachers, you know, see it very differently who are actually their customers. Uh, but yeah, from, from our perspective, you, you have to report to someone and that individual or individuals determines the weights or they have to tell you who else determines them. You can't go in and dictate the weights to them. Uh, you get fired very quickly. But it's important for you to be flexible and have the, the knowledge to know that it, it could be another person. And you can find those people. And they, if they say it's okay to talk to the teachers, then that's what you do. And that's been our experience. That, that happens a lot, actually. Meaning you go in and you learn an area and you f quickly figure out that really this should be the teachers telling us this, but the superintendent hired me, so what do I do? Yeah. Any other questions? Last, last question. Yes. Earlier you alluded that you had some results using this, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you had any examples of this in case scenarios. I don't have them uh, in the presentation, but uh, we've written about them, and I have a student doing uh, a dissertation project on that. And, and so what we did, we actually um, did a study. It was with um, two speech systems. This is one example. Uh, and these are your voice portals, like if you call Delta Airlines and you talk to the system, things like that. We took a couple of those and we took a group of students and gave them a tab, a goal, and had them use it. And we calculated the hum using several different measures. And then we showed how we could compare those systems. Like, so we, 
we had a home that was 70, uh, 2010, for example, and then we do uh, change those variables, but we show them for both systems. And you'll see that in, in each case, how they change relative to each other. So we've done stuff like that, but the thing that, that's most successful is that when we do this type of an approach, we find that people understand it, what it means. So there's this, there's this gap between uh, what a client understand, understands and, and what, how they interpret things versus the actual expert. So right now, currently, if you were to hire someone to do a usability study for you, they give you a long report. And in that report, they talk about all the different metrics that they capture. And they'll try and summarize that for you. But you'll often find that the client is sitting there like a deer in the headlights saying, I don't know, what is, the, is it good or not? Can you just tell me that? <laughs> That's what you, they get frustrated because you'll say, well, we're good on this. We're not so good here. We get better here. And you don't know how to interpret that. So that's been the biggest finding in this, is that when they see that single figure and they say, oh, okay, I get it, and then, they'll, then you can drill down. So in other words, I'm starting high and drilling down rather than all these details and trying to come up. So that's been our biggest success. It's easier to start high with a number, and then they say, okay, so what does that mean? And then I can go back and show them the weights. And then they say, oh, that's right, we did say that was more important. So that's been a success. <coughs> Thank you very much. A round of applause. Thank you.